there's a lot of sort of introduction and explanation I could make regarding 2 Peter, but usually I find the best way to do it is to jump right into it, and whatever introduction needs to be made will make it along the way. So right here, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, we read, Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter begins this letter, first of all, by introducing himself, Simon Peter. By the way, isn't that sort of interesting? Just how he introduced himself, using the name Simon Peter. His given name was Simon. His second name, given to him by Jesus himself, was Peter. Do you remember that occasion from Matthew chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, where Jesus said, You are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. Peter meaning something like rock. Well, th this is fascinating to think that Peter, even though he was given this wonderful name by Jesus, Peter, he would still refer to himself, at least at times, as Simon Peter. I, I think maybe he just always wanted to remember that there was some of the Simon in there as well as some of the Peter. I mean, he knew he hadn't gone to heaven yet. 1 Peter and 2 Peter's books have the heavenlies very much in mind. That's one of the things we think of as a major theme through these books. But Peter knew that he wasn't there yet. So it's Simon Peter. And who is he writing to? Notice here. He says, to those who have obtained like precious faith. Now, a few things to think about. First of all, I hope that's you. I hope you have obtained the same precious faith that Peter had, but this is what I want you to understand, is Peter saying that we can have the same faith he had. This is a man who walked with Jesus. I mean, literally. I hope that you and I metaphorically walk with Jesus. He walks with me. He talks with me. I mean, you have that. That's great. And it's a wonderful way to speak and everything. We get that picture. But there's nothing metaphorical about the way that Peter walked with Jesus around the Sea of Galilee. How about this? There was nothing metaphorical about the way that Peter walked with Jesus on the Sea of Galilee, at least for a few steps. He literally walked with Jesus. And you would think, what a faith this man has. Oh, man, if I was one of the apostles, I'd never doubt Jesus again. Oh, my faith would be so unshakable. No, Peter says, you can have the same faith that I have. Because sometimes we think that true faith or true assurance would be a matter of touching, a matter of seeing with our eyeballs, a matter of hearing with our eardrums. And Peter says, no, it's not about that. It's about the work of faith that God does in the heart. We can have the same faith as first century believers. We can have the same faith as Peter, chief among the apostles himself. Now notice this bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. I'll just mention this. Because really, what we are, we're doing a survey of 2 Peter here. But if I was not filled with the spirit of self-control right now, I could go on about 15 minutes on how Peter calls himself first a bondservant, then an apostle. Let that roll around in your head just for a minute. Bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have been obtained like precious faith with us. I hope that's all of us. By the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, again, full disclosure here this evening. I feel like I say this often. Maybe I say it too much. I'm not a Greek scholar. If you put a New Testament in the Greek language in front of me, I'd be able to pick out a few words and phrases and tell you, but overall, what would I say? It's Greek to me. I mean, I, I just, it, I, I, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I do know how to read the guys who are Greek scholars. And those who are Greek scholars say that there's something distinctive about the grammar of Peter's statement here. And the grammar of Peter's statement means this, that when he says, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the grammar demands that that is both speaking of Jesus. In other words, 
Some people might say, well, he's speaking of our God in heaven, and then a second person, our Savior, Jesus Christ. No, there's a grammatical rule there. I believe, I'm doing this off the top of my head, the Granville Sharp rule, I believe it's called, that in the grammar demands that what Peter's speaking about is God and Savior have the same subject, Jesus Christ himself. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter, he's putting his cards right out on the table. Jesus Christ is God. God. God in human flesh who walked among us. Verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I just read to you three verses, but there is enough spiritual nourishment and wisdom in those three verses to get you by for all of this year. I'm telling you, it's the truth. So let's just do a little preliminary unpacking of this together. First of all, he gives a greeting. Did you see that in verse 2? Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Grace and peace, these two most precious gifts of God. I tell you, you, you can have a lot of things in this world, but if you don't have the grace of God in your life and you don't have the peace of God in your life, you don't have much. You don't have much at all. And he says, these things are ours in what? Look at the phrasing there. They are ours in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. As we know God, we gain the essentials of grace and peace, these salvations for living, the, excuse me, these foundations for living. Now notice how he puts it in verse 3. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now you would think if it would be enough for God's power to give you his grace and his peace. That's enough, Lord. That's enough. Just give me your grace and your peace. Don't you think you could go a long way in this world if your life was filled with the grace and peace of God? Yes, Lord, that would be enough. But God says, no, that's not enough. Even beyond my grace, even beyond my peace, I'm going to give you, look at the phrasing there in verse 3, all things that pertain to life and godliness. All of these things are ours, notice the phrase, through the knowledge of him. Brothers and sisters, listen to me carefully. Knowing God is the key to all things that pertain to life and godliness. Do you want to unlock the key to life? Do you want to unlock the key to... Unlock the key. No, you don't unlock a key. Do you want the key for the lock of godliness? Do you want the key to the lock of things that make for everything in life? Then what do you do? This is what you need to do. You need to seek knowing God. The answers are in him. It's the knowledge of God that brings these things. And friends, let me tell you something. In this world, even within the church, we are willing to try almost everything except the knowledge of God. So I'll try anything else except that. We'll trust in the schemes and the plans of men instead of the knowledge of God. We'll try knowing ourselves instead of the knowledge of Him. Let me tell you something. Knowing yourself is not the answer to your problems. I'm not saying that that's completely useless knowledge. But it's not the key that will unlock the door. The key that will unlock the door is the knowledge of God. We need to come to the same place that the Apostle Paul did when he triumphantly exclaimed in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, where he said, that I may know him. That's what our life needs to be about, knowing God. And notice this, we come to the knowledge of him, how? Through the word of God, through prayer, through the community of God's people. Now, let me stress that one through the community of God's people. We need God alone, but God does not come to us merely alone. God often chooses to meet us in the community of his people. 
I cannot fully explain it. But there is more of an encounter of God to be had for the person who sits here on a Wednesday evening in the community of God's people than there is for somebody who listens to this or watches it all by themselves on a later occasion. Now, I don't mean to imply that God can't use it in a powerful way because we know that he does. God can use it for the person who listens to it all by themselves or who watches it all by themselves. There's plenty of power and grace of God in those things. But listen, there is something dynamic that God does in the community of his people that increases, that adds to our potential to grow in the knowledge of him. God does not meet us only in our solitude, but also in the community of his people. So he calls us. Notice this, verse 3. He called us by glory and virtue. Look, I don't mean to upset anybody here. He called us by glory and virtue. I'm sorry, it's not your glory and your virtue that he called you by. I, I know you thought, well, God thought I was so glorious and so virtuous that he just had to call me. No. He called you by the glory and virtue of who? Jesus. Isn't that wonderful to know? That his calling in your life isn't dependent on your glory and virtue, but on his own. And then it says, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. In other words, by the glory and virtue of Jesus, God has given to us, to you and to me, great and precious promises. Now that gets, makes it even better. Because if God gave the promises based on my glory and virtue, how big would those promises be? Oh, pretty small. I'd make your fingers a little bit smaller there, Bob. Re really small. But if he gives me promises based on the glory and virtue of Jesus, how big are those promises? Can't even measure them. That is the basis. It's by those very uh, that by that very glory and virtue that the promises are made. And that's why his promises are exceedingly great. And I want you to notice this. I think sometimes the most wonderful word in verse 4 is the small two-letter word, us. Us. It's for us. Not only the great apostles like Peter. Not only the first century believers like those Peter originally wrote to. Not only Jewish believers. Ladies and gentlemen, this is for us. Thousands of years later, we are connected by faith with the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And great and precious promises are for us that through these, through these great and precious promises, look now at verse 4, you may be partakers of the divine nature. Sometimes I wish I didn't have a headset mic. I had a handheld mic so I could just drop it right there. Partakers of the divine nature. You and I, as believers in Jesus, in some way, and I'm going to admit this, I cannot fully describe this. I don't even think I can partially describe it. But in some way, as believers in Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, we share in the very nature of God. Sometimes, as Christians, we are too... Hmm, you know, I'm thinking of these words and thinking, should I really say this or not? So I'll say it, and then I can fix it later, hopefully. Sometimes as Christians, we're too humble. Now, what do I mean by too humble? Well, that's a pretty rare disease among Christians, excessive humility. Maybe this is the way. Okay, I'm thinking this through just as I'm saying it. We're humble in the wrong ways. That's a much better way to put it. We're proud about ourselves. We're too humble about the work that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Because it's staggering to think that by my relationship with him in faith, he has made me a participant, a partaker, someone who shares in the divine nature itself. I am, you are, we are connected to the very nature of God partakers of the divine nature. It, it's a remarkably generous and, and loving aspect of God. Let me tell you something. He could have rescued my soul from hell without ever saying partake of my nature. 
did he have to do that to save me from hell? No. He goes, oh, poor David. I pity him so much. Look at how lost and blind he is. He so much needs my help. I will lift him up from his destined place in hell, and I'll even allow him a place in heaven. And we say, yes, Lord, you're so wonderful for doing that. Look at all that mercy you've shown to this poor subject, David. But then he says, no, 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 I'll give him more. I will allow him to share my very nature. This shows the love, the greatness, the goodness of God. And so, friends, be very humble about yourself, but get a little more boastfully proud about what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. He's made you a partaker of the divine nature. Well, uh, going on here, he says, verse 4, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. God is above and beyond the corruption of this world. It should also be that way with those who are the partakers of the divine nature. If we share in his divine nature, then is, is God part of the corrupt lusts of this world? No, no. Uh, people didn't raise their hand, but you didn't have to. You understand the right answer to that question, don't you? Okay, it's all right. God does not partake. He does not participate in the corrupt lusts of this world. Therefore, if I am a partaker of his nature, neither should I. Do, do you realize how much of Christian living comes down to this simple exhortation? Be who you are in Jesus Christ. Who are you? You're a partaker of the divine nature. You share in the right. Now go out and live that way. Not, not go out and live really good so that someday you may achieve this position, a partaker of the divine No, in Jesus Christ, you share in the divine nature. Now go out and live that way. Be what you truly are in Jesus Christ. Now, how do we live that? Look, he shows us very practically how in verses 5, 6, and 7. He says, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Now, he gives this list, add to your faith virtue. It progresses from virtue into knowledge, from knowledge into self-control, from perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love, with love being the capstone of all of God's work in us. Now, when you read through that list, right there in verses 5, 6, and 7, how did you react? Did, did any of us have the feeling, well, you know, that, that's just not my thing. Not that one. Um, okay, uh, uh, faith, all right, good, I'm good with that. Virtue, uh, maybe knowledge, okay, I'm good with knowledge. Self-control, no. Perseverance, well, that's up and down. You know, sometimes we read this and we think it's like a Chinese menu. We can pick and choose. No. This is given to us in a comprehensive way, isn't it? This is the character that reflects the divine nature all these things are reflective of God himself. And he says, live like this to surely show that you are a partaker of the divine nature. But don't miss that word that begins, or, or, or really is in the second section, I should say, of verse 5, where he says, giving all diligence. That's huge. These things do not happen by accident in the Christian life. It's not like God pours into us knowledge as we just sort of passively receive. Okay, God, I'm going to go to bed at night and I'll put my Bible right next to my head on my pillow. Would you please fill my head with biblical knowledge? That's not, no, what do you have to do? Give all diligence. You want to grow in knowledge of Jesus? Give all diligence. You want to grow in faith? Give all diligence. You want to grow in self-control? Give all diligence. There's something in it that God invites us to participate with him and work out what he has worked into us. And this gives us great assurance. Look at what he says here in verses 8 and 9. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. All right, verses 8 and 9 
have the potential to bring a lot of guilt here this evening. And, and it's not my intention, but I need to be very straightforward with you about this. Notice what he says, verses 8 and 9. For if these things are yours, the qualities mentioned in the previous three verses, if these things are yours and they abound, in other words, you say, well, yeah, I, I, of course my life has virtue. I showed virtue once two years ago. No, that's it. He's saying, if they abound, what does he say? If these things are yours and they abound, then you have not been barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is where I mean these verses can bring in a lot of guilt. Look, let, let's be really straightforward here. The words barren and unfruitful could characterize many Christian lives. You have a love for Jesus. You, you attend religious services. It, if it came right down to it, you, you would make the ultimate sacrifice and die for your faith. I'm not saying that your faith is illegitimate. But honestly, could some of us honestly take a look at your Christian life and say barren and unfruitful? Now, if that's the case, don't despair. As soon as the Holy Spirit would put his finger on something like this in the Word, there's something that the devil wants to do to drive us to despair. Oh, you see, you are a worthless Christian. You are no good. That's what the devil would shout in your ear. Instead, look at the remedy here that he gives in verse 9. He who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness. When we lack these things, when we are barren and unfruitful in our Christian life, it means we have eye trouble. What's the eye trouble? We're short-sighted. That's how Peter described it there in verse 9. We're unable to see God and we're only able to see ourselves. Lord, I'm nearsighted. All I can see is me. I need to be able to put on some Holy Ghost glasses so that I can see you and put my focus there. We're virtually blind because we've forgotten that we were cleansed from our old sins. You see, that's the reason for this condition of barren unfruitful. You've forgotten that you were cleansed from your old sins. Maybe, maybe you forgot just how bad you were and how much you needed cleansing. Do, do you ever think that if God really opened up our eyes to how lost we were without him, wouldn't that change everything? So maybe we've forgotten that. Maybe we have forgotten the great cost that Jesus paid to purge our sins. You see, because when we remember that we are cleansed from our old sins, we remember how we were cleansed from our sins. And how were we cleansed from our sins? By what Jesus did on the cross. No other way. It wasn't through our good deeds or our resolutions or turning over a new leaf or promising to be better or even making amends. No, all those things can be good and right in themselves, but that's not what cleanses us. Maybe we forgot how dirty we were. Maybe we forgot the great cost that it took to cleanse us. Or maybe we forgot how great and complete the cleansing is. Do you want to know how great and complete the cleansing is? Because in Isaiah, it says that the guilty sinner, even though they were once as red as crimson, think of crimson red, now they are white as snow. That's complete cleansing. I'll tell you what, if you will keep heavy in your mind how great your need was, how great the price that was paid for your salvation, and how complete the cleansing was that Jesus did in you, that will give you a foundation for a Christian life that is neither barren nor unfruitful. But if you look at the Christian life as some kind of social club where we get together and rub elbows with a bunch of swell people, and it's just kind of like a, you know, a, a community organization with a Bible, there's not much power in that, friends. 
There's power in remembering what Jesus did to save us. Verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you'll never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, this is how you can be sure that you're called and sure that you're elect, but it's by doing these things that are described in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5, 6, and 7. Faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. As we see these things in our life, we're becoming more and more like Jesus. And do you know what God's great plan is for our life? Paul expressed in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, God's great plan is to conform us into the image of his son. He wants us all to be like little Jesuses. Now, not, not that he'll make us in some sort of weird cookie-cutter fashion that we all just look like the classic Jesus with the hair and the beard and all that. No, no, no. That we have the character, the beautiful character of Jesus replicated in us over and over again. That's what God wants to work in us. And when we see that work happening, we know I'm on the right track. My calling, my election is sure. And if I do those things, look at verse 10, I'll never stumble. In pursuing these things, we keep from stumbling. Continuing in growth and progress in the Christian life is the sure way to keep from stumbling, to keep pressing on after Jesus. And look at verse 11, entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, I don't know exactly what it means to get an abundant entrance into heaven, but man, I want it, whatever that is. Paul, the apostle, spoke about those in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 of those who are saved by the skin of their teeth. I didn't really know that my teeth had skin. And if your teeth have skin, it's not much. That's a pretty small measure. Paul's talking about people who barely make it into heaven. Now listen, it would be better to barely make it into heaven than to not make it there at all. We fully admit that. But ladies and gentlemen, how much more for us to have our calling and election sure and to be confident in Jesus Christ, to be confident that our entrance into heaven will abound. Matter of fact, F.B. Meyer, he wrote that the idea of an abundant entrance into heaven was really, he translated it this way, it, he called it a choral entrance, like with a choir around you. And he said that the idea was of a Roman conqueror coming into the city, being welcomed by singers and musicians who would join him in a glorious, happy procession into the city. It's like, man, if you go full on with your walk with Jesus Christ, you're going to be welcomed with applause into heaven. Who knows? Maybe there's going to be so you sneak into heaven by the doggy door or something like that. But Peter says, look, you just give attention to these basics of the Christian life and you will have an abundant entrance into heaven. That's what we want. Now, how do we build that kind of life? Verse 12. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Peter just wrote about the promise of the entrance into the everlasting kingdom of God. And because that is so important, because heaven and hell ride on that, he's willing to remind us always of the basics of the Christian life. That's why he says, notice it there, verse 12, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you know, Peter is anticipating some of his readers rolling their eyes just a little bit. You're talking to us about faith again, Peter? You're talking to us about heaven again? You're talking to us about knowing God again, Peter? Haven't we moved on to bigger and better things? And Peter says, not really. Peter says, I don't apologize for reminding you about these things again and again and again. In light of what's at stake, your eternal destiny, it's worth it to go over these ideas again and again and again. If uh, there's an athletic team 
that's uh, going for the championship. You, you could say it's a basketball team. What is one thing that the coach is going to stress in the practices with the players all over again? The fundamentals. Dribbling, passing, shooting. Dribbling, passing, shooting. Do you use the same drills over and over again? The same fundamentals get pounded into you again and again and again. You learn those fundamentals again, again, and again. Why? Because you never leave them. You, you may learn how to do other things and better things, but you never leave the fundamentals. That basketball player never stops dribbling, passing, shooting. Well, some of the bad ones, they don't pass very much. They just shoot. But you get the idea. The fundamentals never leave you. And that's what Peter's trying to express this. He says, we're going for a championship here. I don't apologize for stressing the fundamentals again and again and again. Now, look at the urgency that he has, verses 13 and 14. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Um, and then he adds in verse 15, Moreover, I might be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Now, far be it from me to accuse Peter of being manipulative, but he is pulling out the, I'm going to die, won't you listen to me card right here. It's a reflection of how serious he is. Peter looked and understood that he would die, probably by martyrdom very shortly, because Peter understood that Jesus told him in John chapter 21, Jesus told him that he would die a martyr's death. Peter understood that. And whatever the circumstances were, maybe he wrote this from imprisonment. Maybe he wrote this from a time of great crisis or persecution. Maybe in some way, maybe through supernatural knowledge, Peter knew my time is short and I'm going to die as a martyr very soon. By the way, you know what very strong Christian tradition says that the, that the way Peter died in his martyrdom was. Was he was crucified. But when they were about to crucify Peter, he said, no, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as my Lord. Crucify me upside down. And according to the very strong Christian tradition, the Romans in their cruelty crucified Peter upside down and he died on a cross demanding it not worthy to suffer the same way his Savior did. He could see that end very close on the horizon. And he's not manipulating, but what he's saying is, listen, I know I'm going to die. I'm done messing around with the superficial things. This is important, folks. You, you, you listen to the words of a man who knows he's going to die soon. And so he says, I must put off this tent. Don't you love that reference to the body as a tent? Look, what, what do you do if you're living in a tent? You, you take care of it, don't you? You live in a tent. You want the tent to be good. You don't want it to leak water. You don't want the zippers to break. You do what you can to clean it, to take care of it. You do what you can with the tent. But listen, you're not trying to make it the Taj Mahal either, are you? You realize it's a tent. I've got a better dwelling to come. And as I get older, being in my mid-50s right now, I thank God that there's a better dwelling to come. And that this tent, you know, it has its purpose. But there's a better, more permanent dwelling to show, to come. So he says, I, I, I want to give you a reminder after my decease that you'd carry on these things. And then now, look at what he says in verses 16, 17, and 18. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the everlasting, from the, excuse me, from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Now, Peter's going to explain to us why we can trust him. Peter, why should I trust you? Don't give me the sob story about how you're going to die. Why should I trust you? He says, well, let me tell you a story. We have not followed 
fables or myths. We have followed true testimony. By the way, testimony that the apostles endured torture for and suffered death for this testimony. It wasn't based on fables. It wasn't based on half-truths. He says, I was an eyewitness of his majesty. Uh, the word fables there in verse 15, it translates the ancient Greek word mythos. Mythos from myths. Some people think that the gospel and the biblical record, they're just a bunch of ancient myths. That they may admire their power as myths, but Peter says, no, this is no myth. This is something that we saw as eyewitnesses. And what were we? Look at verse 16. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. When was Peter an eyewitness of the majesty of Jesus? Well, I can think of a lot of occasions. Man, I, I saw him heal a blind man. That's majesty. I saw him feed 5,000. That's majesty. I saw him walk on the Sea of Galilee and then pull me up when I was sinking. That's majesty. He could go, on, I saw majesty. But then we goes, no, let me give you one example. When we were on the Mount of Transfiguration, and I was there with Peter, James, and John, we were there together, and we saw Jesus transfigured gloriously with what? with Moses and Elijah right beside him. That was it. Peter said, if I could give you one example of being an eyewitness to his glory, I'd tell you what I saw when I saw Jesus transfigured before my very eyes. There was something about that occasion that impressed something upon me so deep, I knew that this was God. I knew that this was the God of all majesty. And then he says something else. I heard something said. What did he hear say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I find it fascinating that Peter would quote this because God spoke this from heaven as a rebuke to Peter. Do you remember what Peter said when he saw Jesus, Moses, and Elijah there on the Mount of Transfiguration? He said, Lord, this is great. Let us build three tabernacles so that we can stay here forever. And what was the mistake Peter made? By using the word three. Saying kind of all on par. You, Moses, and Elijah, you're all... And Peter probably thought he was complimenting Jesus. I'm putting you on the same level as Moses and Elijah. And God the Father says, no, no. Forget about Moses and Elijah. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This, Jesus himself. And so it's interesting, this voice that was a rebuke to Peter... That which was once a rebuke became for Peter a sweet memory when he heard the voice that came from heaven. Now, if you saw Jesus transfigured in your midst and Moses and Elijah right next to him and you heard the voice of God from heaven, would you be impressed? I would. That, that would make like a lifelong impression upon me. I'm sure it would you as well. That would be impressive. Okay, don't forget that. Now let's read verse 19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now notice this. We have the prophetic word confirmed. We have the prophetic word more sure. What is more confirmed and more sure than seeing Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? The prophetic word. You and I have access to something even greater, something more certain than a vision of Jesus. What's more certain than a vision of Jesus? I'll tell you what's more certain. Something that you would, he says in verse uh, there, 19, which you do well heed. What's more certain than the transfigured Jesus 
is the fulfillment of the prophetic word. Do you realize how astounding it is that God spoke things hundreds of years before they ever happened and then they happened exactly as God spoke? Do you realize what a confirmation that is to the divine origin, to the divine voice of the Bible? That's even more sure than seeing... Because, ladies and gentlemen, especially in today's day and age, if you thought you saw Jesus transfigured in an image, it might be a hologram. How, how could you even know it was for sure? It could be a deceptive spiritual phenomenon foisted upon you as an angel of light. It's possible. But I'll tell you, what's even more certain than something you might think you saw with your own eyes, what's even more certain than that is the certainty of God's fulfilled word. I'll give you one example of this. You see, when we understand that there are at least 332 distinct Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah that Jesus fulfilled perfectly, 332 prophecies about the Old Testament Messiah that Jesus fulfilled perfectly. And the combination of that evidence brought together from a simply statistical perspective, is absolutely overwhelming. There's a man, I've read his research, Professor Peter Stoner. He's calculated that the probability of any one man in the first century fulfilling eight of these prophecies, just eight of them, is one in, oh, it's a really big number, 10 to the 17th power. 10 with 17 zeros after it. That, that's big. Supposedly, and listen, I don't know who measures such things. Supposedly, if you had that many silver dollars, you could cover the state of Texas two feet deep in silver dollars. So it would be like covering the state of Texas two feet deep in silver dollars, painting one of them red, and then just reaching in and grabbing it out. Now, that's eight prophecies. And how do they calculate? Well, they do things like this. It says the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Well, how many villages are there in Judea? Well, there's, you know, X number in Judea. Then the prophecy of him being actually born in Bethlehem is one in however many. You know, and so they just go through and calculate. So Peter Stoner's done the research, said the eight prophecies is one to the 17th power. Then he calculated, what would it be for Jesus to have fulfilled 48 of the prophecies. And the odds became one, excuse me, one to 10 in the 157th power. I don't even want to call that number. It's a big number. Show them what a big number it is, Bob. One in 10 to the 157th power. Now, look, you, you don't have to be a statistical genius to figure out that this is a sure word. Even more sure than seeing what you might see with your own eyes. Because your eyes your mind can deceive you. But we have a prophetic word made certain. A prophetic word made more sure that we can trust in and rely regarding God's revelation. Well, let's just take a quick look here at the last couple of verses, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. See, even in Peter's own day, enemies of Jesus twisted Old Testament prophecies, giving them personal and bizarre meanings. They were attempting to exclude Jesus from their fulfillment. They would look at a passage like Isaiah chapter 53. Now, I don't have time to get into it, but nod your head if you know something about Isaiah chapter 53. Okay, if you read Isaiah 53, let that be your homework tonight. Read Isaiah chapter 53, and you tell me, does that speak about Jesus? But there would be people, they'd, they'd, they'd read Isaiah 53 and say, well, that's not Jesus. Look, that, that's someone making their own bizarre interpretation of prophecy. It's a private interpretation. Now, by the way, even though Peter here spoke of the prophecy of Scripture, the same principle is at work for the gift of prophecy today. In other words, 
if God might give a prophetic word to somebody in our congregation, which he may do. Absolutely. God speaks to prophetic gifts even to our present day. But if God were to give a prophetic word, he would not give it to only one person in the congregation, but he would give confirmation around it. So, so you wouldn't have a situation like this. Well, God told me that the church should do this, but nobody else in the leadership of the church had the same witness of the Spirit. No, that would be something of a private interpretation. And we just believe that if God is really speaking, then he's going to give a consensus, a testimony of his Spirit among those who would lead in the congregation. But prophecy never came, verse 21, by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Look, this is one of the few places in scriptures where it gives us a picture of how people brought forth the Bible. They were moved by the Holy Spirit. When God spoke to Peter and he wrote this letter by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it wasn't like spirit writing. You know, Peter's eyes rolled back in his head and the pen just started moving on the parchment. It wasn't like that. God moved through his mind. God moved through his personality. God moved through his thinking. But at the same time, it was being guided by the Holy Spirit all along the way. One commentator, uh, Green, says this, that the ancient Greek word that's translated moved here in verse 21, it has the sense of being carried along like a ship being carried along by a wind or a current. In other words, what God did was he gave the writers of scriptures the ability to raise their sails and then the wind of the Holy Spirit blew them into exactly the right place to write scripture. Now, God's not writing scripture today, but there's a principle there for us today, and we can leave it on this. When the Holy Spirit blows his wind, don't you want to have your sail up so that you can be moved by the Holy Spirit in just the place where he wants you to be? Sometimes we are so obsessed with our own effort, we've got out the rows, the oars, and we're rowing, rowing, rowing. Put up your sail and let me move you. God would say. Now, obviously not in the same way to bring forth Scripture. That's another thing entirely. And God's done bringing forth Holy Scripture. But, but in a personal way, God wants to move you and I by His Holy Spirit. Doing so will help us to have that calling and election sure. So, Father, this is our prayer here this evening. Lord, I pray that in all of this, you would show us this tremendous truth of what it means to truly be a partaker of the divine nature. Lord, that's more than we can take in. But it's not more than you can give. So Jesus, we want to receive it from you here this evening. And Lord, I, I pray especially for anybody here tonight who's burdened or troubled, that you would help them to put up the sail of faith here this evening. So that as your Holy Spirit would blow through this place, they would be moved along and in just the right direction that you would have them to be. Thank you, Lord. Do it, Lord, in our midst. Help us to put up that sail of faith to be moved by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen.